Uh, thank you so much for that. So um, I'm going to talk about amibiasis. Um, so intestinal amibiasis is caused by intamoeba histolytica. I mean, I found that this was very interesting because I mean, it's it's something that we see very often in the developing countries. Like 40 to 50 million people develop colitis and uh, or intestinal disease, and we have more than 40,000 deaths uh, per year. Uh, so a little bit about the history. Um, the first case of uh, dysentery was described in Russia uh, by Fedor Losh in, 19, in 1875. So he, 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 he saw the organism and he called it initially Amoeba coli. So then uh, the organism was renamed uh, in 1903 by uh, the person who is in the picture that is, uh, his name is Schodin. He was a German zoologist that was a, also the one who described the agent of syphilis. Uh, he died in 1906, three years after uh, changing the name of the organism because of an amoeba, amoeba abscess. Uh, and it was it's supposed to be um, because of a self-inflicted uh, infection. So I'm glad as an ID fellow that we don't do that anymore. So a little bit about the epidemiology. So as I said, I mean, this is more prevalent in uh, developing countries uh, because of the poor sanitation levels. Um, there are high rates of amoeba, amoeba infection in India, Africa, Mexico, Central and South America. And uh, there are areas where the prevalence can be as, as high as 50% of the population. Um, in, in, in countries like, like this one, like in the US, I mean, you see this disease basically from people that are coming from these endemic, endemic areas. Uh, the cycle, so everything starts um, when when uh, the, the seeds and the trophozoites are passed in, in the feces. So once the, the, the seeds are in the environment, they mature, and then uh, a, a person gets infected through contaminated water or, or food, then the, the seed goes to the colon, so once it's in the colon, you develop the trophozoites, and the trophozoites can go to the liver, causing um, liver abscesses, can stay in the colon, co causing the dysentery, uh, can stay there without causing any problems sometimes, and it can go to the lungs through direct contact uh, through the pleura, it can go to the heart, or it describes sometimes, but it's very rare, that it can go also to the brain through the blood. So how this happens, I mean, the organism is able to produce proteinases. It can also cause, uh, I mean, it can also kill cells by a contact dependent mechanism. It can also induce apopt apoptosis. And um, it also causes uh, uh, amebospores. That is a, is a family of small peptides that can destroy the lipid bilayers and that can cause cytologies, cy cytolysis. And it can also increase the permeability of the uh, of the gut uh, through disruption of the tight junction proteins. Uh, Intamoeba histolytica is not the only amoeba that you can find in the in the human intestinal lumen. You can also find an other ones that is called Dispar, Mochkovsky, Polecki, Coli, and Hartmanni. But from all of these, the only one that causes disease is the uh, Intam Intamoeba histolytica. Some of the pictures here that I'm going to explain later. So clinical manifestations, 90% uh, of the cases are asymptomatic. Uh, usually people that have severe disease are in one of these groups, um, um, young age, pregnancy, corticosteroid treatment, patients with malignancy, malnutrition, and alcoholism. The, the onset is usually subacute. Uh, you can usually the most frequent symptoms are diarrhea and bloody stools. You can also have abdominal pain, weight loss, fever only in 8 to 38 percent, and uh, it can be as bad as causing a fulminant colitis with bowel necrosis. Sites of infections, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it can be in the colon and it can cause colitis. It can cause an amoeba that is like a tumor that if you see it in an x-ray or in a CT scan, it can look like a malignancy. So you, they can go for surgery, they extract it, and they found that it's only amoebas. Uh, it can also cause uh, toxic megacolon. It can cause liver abscesses. If the liver abscess I mean, ruptures, it can cause peritonitis. 
can cause lung empyema, heart pericarditis. Uh, it can also cause um, abscesses in the brain, but it's very rare. And it can cause irritation of the skin uh, in the perineal and genital area. And uh, sometimes it can also cause fistula rectovaginal. Um, thing that is very characteristic for this organism is that it can cause liver abscesses. Um, from uh, um, Dr. Green's lecture, he always tells about this. I mean, you can aspirate the, the, the abscess and you can see uh, anchovy paste like material, like in the picture that you are seeing there. Um, when you it's, it's when you see an abscess, you don't really need to aspirate all the times. You can just give treatment and it can absorb by itself. Because sometimes when you don't do it well, in, and if you, you cause spillage of the content, it can, call, it can cause a peritonitis and that can increase the mortality. You can use the fluid, if you get it, to send it for antigen detection and make the diagnosis. And sometimes when the when the uh, abscess is very big and, and it breaks through the lungs, it can you can you can have a, a cough with uh, with productive uh, material coming that is basically the the content of the abscess. So the diagnosis is be, I mean you can do it through serology, and you can do it by the identification of the parasite in the st in the stool or in the intestinal sites like in the liver abscess. Uh, and the best way is, is basically a combination of both. And the reason is I'm going to explain later. A little bit about the uh, mi microscopy. So um, this is the, uh, the trophozoite. So basically the, the size is between uh, uh, 15 to 60 uh, micrometers. And um, you can see uh, the, the, nucle the nuclei and in the center, in the middle, just in the middle, the nucleosome. That, that's basically how you see the amoeba. Usually the uh, uh, entamoeba histolytica and entamoeba dispar can have sometimes uh, red blood cells in the middle. I'm going to show pictures about that later. This is a cyst. So you can see the trophozoite or you can see the cyst. If you see the cyst, you can see uh, that most of the time you can see four nuclei. There is one here, one here, one here. There is one more here. So in order to see all the nuclei, you have to move the microscope, but you, you will see the four of them. Um, in order to have a better sensitivity, it's recommended to have three specimens on three different days. If you do that, you will have a sensitivity of 85 to uh, 95 percent. Uh, you can also concentrate the sample. You can, uh, you can put it in a centrif centrifuge. And uh, once you do that, you, you can have a, a bigger sensitivity. So um, the trophozoites, in order to see them, it has to be a fresh sample. So you can you, you, you take a little bit of a stool, you put it on, on, on saline, and you can see the trophozoites. You can, you can uh, stain them with iron hematoxylin or Whitlitz trichrome. OK. So as I was saying before, sometimes you can see uh, red blood cells inside of the trophozoite, and this is very characteristic of uh, entamoeba histolytica, but you can also see that for entamoeba dispar. And um, that is important because it's suggestive that it's, 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 uh, it's caused by the entamoeba histolytica, if you see that, but it's, it's not pathognomonic. Um, you can also think that every patient, because there is an inflammation, you can have uh, fecal leukocytes, but sometimes you don't see them because the organism destroys the, uh, the leukocytes. Um, I, I'm presenting this uh, article because, I mean, it, it uh, tells how, how good is the, the diagnosis when you use a rapid anti antigen test. Uh, according to this article, you can have a, a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 100% compared to the result from a standard ELISA antigen detection. If you use antibodies to detect it, uh, you can have a sensitivity of 89 to 100% and a specificity of 89 to 95%. And uh, if you use serology, in that case, you can differentiate between entamoeba histolytica and, and entamoeba dispar that you cannot do just with, with the microscopy. Um, if you have extra intestinal disease like liver abscess, the serology is even better because you're going to make more, more antibodies and you, you, you can have uh, uh, 
a better result. You can also make a sigmoidoscopy or a colonoscopy, but it's not recommended. And the reason is because the, the, the tissue is very inflamed and you can cause a perforation. But let's see that you did it because you didn't know what, what, what was happening. So what you see is uh, this lesion that is called a flask-shaped uh, amoebic ulcer. And if you biopsy this, you can see the trophozoites or you can see the, uh, the cysts. The treatment, um, if you see somebody that has entamoeba histolytic and you confirm with serology and, and uh, microscopy, you have to treat, even if the patient is asymptomatic, because the, 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 the risk of developing complication in the future if you don't treat is very high. Um, if you see other amoebas, like this part or Moshkovsky, you don't need to treat. If you have an asymptomatic patient, um, you treat with this, uh, these uh, medications, uh, iodoquinol, uh, paramomycin, or diloxanide, and the, the doses you, you, can, you can see there. If you have a patient with diarrhea, with mild to moderate infection, then you use flagell. You use flagell, and after you use the flagell, you use a luminal agent like paramomycin or iodoquinol for uh, seven days or 20 days. And if the patient is allergic to flagell or you can use it for another reason, you can use dinidazole or nitoxoxanine. If you have ex extra hepatic or severe infection, you can use flagell uh, for 10 days, and it also has to be followed by a luminal agent. Uh, as, as the same as we were talking before. You can use also tinidazole. For liver abscess, as I was mentioning, you don't need to aspirate for treatment. I mean, you do it if, uh, if it is not resolving, but if, if you treat and you see that there is a, the, the, the symptoms are better and it's shrinking, you don't, you don't need to aspirate. And uh, if, you have, if you develop peritonitis, then you need surgical intervention and broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, a little bit about prevention. So, I mean, if you go to an area where you know that there is a, a high risk of developing that, so basically you have to uh, drink water that is in bottles, uh, avoid eating uncooked food, avoid sexual practices that they may need to fecal oral contact. And there, there are studies that um, they are working in, in, an, in a vaccine, but it's in progress, and I mean, there they, they is not uh, a vaccine available at this time. So these are my references. Um, I use the, the CDC website, Wikipedia, up to date. Uh, there are very good cases in the Gorgas course. You can you can see them there, and uh, John Hopkins Antibiotic Guide and and, and e-medicine from Medscape. And that's it.